All right. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Lost my voice. This is the most talking I've done in a week, so I was expecting it to go. All right. So as we're reviewing the story of Ruth, we kind of get a picture painted of what uh, the time of judges was like in Israel. Um, it was difficult to be someone who was not part of a family name. Someone who didn't have access to supply for themselves. We read, uh, I just read a lot about gleaning the harvest. What someone does when they glean is they essentially go around behind the harvesters, the reapers, and anything that kind of falls on the ground or is usually on the corner of the fields and around the, the perimeter that the harvesters don't catch, they have access to. They kind of just pick up and clean the rest and try to hold. It is not an easy life. Um, Reapers and gleaners, gleaners behind reapers, typically didn't make out with a lot of supply from doing this process during the harvest. So it was essentially, in my mind, it's imagine like, we see the beggars on the side of the road that are asking for like a couple coins, like if you're walking down and they have a cup and you throw in a couple change. It's like that type of a job or lifestyle. They don't get rich, they don't get wealthy, they don't get fat, they don't get happy from doing this. It's just something to kind of keep them alive. Um, it is a very rough, rough life, not for the faint of heart. And it shows Ruth's character that she was willing to jump out and do this. God ordained her to go to the right field. As we find out, it ends up working out very well for her. She's part of Jesus' genealogy as she eventually marries Boaz. Sorry to spoil the ending of the story. I should have said <laughs> spoiler warning first. Um, you'll find that out in a few weeks. Um, but it was perfect for God who ordained. Ruth was faithful to Naomi. And God is showing his faithfulness to her through important ways. We see her work ethic as the uh, young person in charge of the weepers said that she was out there from early morning until now, except for a short rest. She's putting in a lot of effort. Um, though we only have the line of saying this is the person that came back from Naomi, everyone in Bethlehem would have known the story. Bethlehem wasn't like a 500,000 person city like it is now. It was a very small village compared to anything that we know. It's like downtown Oakland or downtown Smithfield where Everyone knows who everyone is, so a Moabite, a foreigner coming in with Naomi, everyone knows. So as soon as he's like, that's Ruth, Boaz is like, I know who this person is. And now, Boaz is a close relative to Naomi, but he's not the closest relative to Naomi. Um, he's a part of her family. He has, he's given a title as Redeemer, which is someone who can redeem the lineage of a lost brother cousin, nephew, or someone. Um, like I said, marriage was complicated back then. It's not like it is now where if you become a widow, then you can be free to find who else you want to marry. Oftentimes widows would try to marry brothers or cousins or someone else of their husband so that their family line would stay intact because as Boaz tells, Boaz is not a poor person. He owns the field. Um, keeping inheritance like that is very, very important to everyone in their family. Um, these guys are just not going to go out to college and make themselves like a performing arts major or someone who's starting their own business. This is how they survive. This is how they sustain. Family identity is incredibly important for them. Um, so he already knows the background of Ruth because it's a family matter. He knows Naomi, what she's gone through. Um, him meeting her is very important. And she's made quite the impression on him. Not only is she working hard, but all of the faithfulness that she has shown to Naomi is something that Boaz wants to reward. So he does things that are very, very uncommon. He allows them to drink water right from the servants or the workers of the field. That's very uncommon. When they have lunch, he provides food for her. But not only provides food for her, but he provides an abundance this is a, a typical biblical theme that we see over and over again. God just doesn't provide for our needs. He ensures that an abundance will be provided. Jesus had this exact thing when he fed 5,000. He performs the miracle, and they're left with 12 baskets left over. God provides an abundance. So Boaz, um, kind of filling in the God-blessing role here, does the same thing with Naomi. And then he adjusts it so that she can pick in and out with the harvesters. He says, 
throw some of the stuff out of your bag when you're done. This is very uncommon. And it allows her to end up with a few, uh, with an epath of grain or F, EFA of grain, however it's pronounced. Um, which is essentially about two weeks worth of supply for him and for her and Naomi. I mean, this is a large amount of grain. Um, and this has continued to happen. The barley harvest, as I spoke last week, was right around Passover because the, the first fruits is like three or four days after Passover, which is right before Easter for us. Um, we now just got into the first fruits of the wheat harvest, Pentecost. Um, in the Jewish calendar is the celebration of the beginning of the wheat harvest and so their harvest They would be harvesting wheat right now. So she does this for about six to eight weeks. That's about the passing of time <coughs> And so we have an important family dynamic Going back and forth here. Ruth is showing her faithfulness to God by coming into Israel Doing all that she can to help provide for her and Naomi Boaz is showing his faithfulness by God by actively following and practicing the law, which we'll talk about in about two seconds. And this is working out to show that God is going to ultimately be ordaining this relationship and this connection, which again, I'm sorry for spoiling it for you. Um, but also God is showing his blessing to everyone through this. He's, this is a blessing to Israel because this connection ultimately becomes part of the lineage of David, the first in, or the second and great king of uh, Israel um, and then it's also a blessing to us through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ of whom Boaz and Ruth are Ancestors, so God blesses the whole world through this reuniting or through this connection, which I think is really cool But there's an element of this that I want to talk about because you might be asking yourself What does this mean to me like? This is cool information you gave me background something. I didn't know about this But how do I walk out of here today and like apply this to my life? Well, I'll feed you baby birds, all right? So let me get a shot of water real quick. Um, simply put, as, as I was wrestling with this passage, I was trying to figure out the connection for you. Something kept coming up with me. What does it mean to be a family member? What does it mean to be a neighbor? Like, what are those things? And then how do they relate to us? Because you see this dynamic here. Ruth calls herself a foreigner in this country. So that means something. That's important. She's a Moabite. She's not an Israelite. Um, I'll step back for a second. All right. The Bible typically deals with three types of people that we see, or four types of people that we see in Scripture. I'll say. The first is an Israelite. In order to be an Israelite, you need to be an ancestor of Jacob, who God changes his name to Israel. So that's Israelite, an ancestor of Jacob, who connects back to Abraham. That's what it means to be an Israelite. Outside of that, you have essentially foreigners, like the rest of the world. It doesn't matter if you're a Philistine or a Moabite or a Babylonian or a Roman. You're a foreigner. You're outside of that relationship to Israel, to Jacob. And so Ruth is absolutely a foreigner. She's not genet a genetic ancestor of Israel. She's a Moabite. Moab was a tribe that was routinely warring against Israel. They were a thorn in their side for a long time. These were not necessarily best friends. And so for her to be a Moabite, coming into Israel, renouncing her previous life, her previous faith, and choosing to follow God is a big moment. This is the first conversion in recorded history and scripture of someone turning towards God. And there is an anchoring of faith here because she doesn't automatically become a descendant of Israel. She has to follow God. She has to join the family of Israel a different way through faith, which is important for us because that's how we join as Gentiles. Unless some of you have Jewish descent, you're Gentiles. You join through faith like the rest of us. That is what the kingdom of God is, is it's people who join through faith. Ancestry doesn't matter anymore. But then, in the time of Ruth, it absolutely did. And so, I'm not just telling you all this to say like, hey, there's other neighbors and stuff. God physically commands Israel, the people, 
how to interact with their neighbors. You have Israelites, you have foreigners, you have neighbors, which is the next one that I want to talk about. Neighbors can get tricky because you have to understand the context in which God uses it when he uses it in scripture. Sometimes neighbor means fellow Israelite, like literally person who lives next door to you, neighbor. Sometimes neighbor is a stand-in for humanity, meaning someone else who is human like you, not necessarily an immediate member of your family. And by family, I mean Israel for the context back here. And so you have to understand the context in which God gives down the command and law because it's really important to know. In Old Testament scripture, there were two core commandments. Jesus highlights them very well in Matthew chapter 22, verses 36, and I'll talk about Luke chapter 10 in a second. When a teacher of the law in Matthew is challenging Jesus and says, tell me what the greatest commandment is, and Jesus says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your mind, this is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two things that Jesus said. If you want to follow God's commandments, you got to love God with everything. You got to love your neighbor as yourself. Those are right out of the Old Testament. Jesus didn't make them up. The first one is known as the Shema. It's from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. That is the Shema. That is the most important prayer in uh, the Old Testament. And then later in teachings, God reminds us multiple places in Leviticus, in Numbers, and in Deuteronomy to love your neighbor as yourself. I'll go to Deuteronomy chapter 23, 19 through 20, just to uh, give you confirmation. Actually, no, I'm not going to give you confirmation there. I'm going to say something else there. <laughs> I like it. I tried to color code my, my scriptures and sometimes... It works well. Sometimes, if I'm a little off thought, it doesn't work great. Um, so just trust me on that one. Love your neighbor as yourself is there. I'll talk about it in Leviticus in one second. Um, but what I want to talk about right here real quickly, because I turned to that passage of Scripture, is an important fact that you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily commanded in the law to treat your fellow Israel exact Israelite exactly the same way as a foreigner among you. We see this in scripture where uh, it says, yeah, yeah, it's verse 19. Uh, you shall not charge interest on loans to your brother, interest on money, interest on food, interest on anything that is lent for interest. So God's giving a law here. He's saying, your brother, your fellow Israelite, do not charge interest on them. And then God says, you may charge a foreigner interest, but you may not charge your, brother's in, your brother interest that the Lord your God may bless you in all that you undertake in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. So you have a moment here when they're saying when you're in trade, you can charge interest to a foreigner, but not a fellow Israelite. That has historical connotations because the reasons why uh, Jews in England back in the 16th, 17th century became so popular is because in their word, they're allowed to trade, charge interest, which made them unique for the banking industry in England. And so the banking industry got very big, very filled with Jewish people because it didn't violate their law to be able to charge interest to non-Jews, which then rose anti-Semitism in the area because if you think about people, you think about taxes, you think of bankers, generally people who are being charged interest from them are not a fan of it. So they were collecting interest for the king, and they were becoming universally hate, hated from the people because of it. Um, so it is, this little passage of law has caused anti-Semitism throughout the world, uh, historically speaking. Um, but it's mostly derived from this of which God gives a standard that is different. You treat a foreigner different than you treat an Israelite. You love your neighbor, you treat your foreigner well, or a sojourner, which you'll hear me say often, sojourner is essentially a temporary resident. It's someone who's moved to the area to work or to trade. They're not an Israelite 
They're not necessarily someone who lives somewhere else in another area. They're in your community. And so there's important passages in Scripture in which you can see where Israelites should be treated differently than foreigners, but not worse. It's not morally wrong to charge someone interest. Gets there eventually if the interest is crazy, like a credit card company. But it's not inherently morally wrong to treat someone differently. It's good business in some respects. Um, but you are not to treat them poorly. You are to love them. You are to help them. You are to support them. As we see in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 16 through 18, it said, you shall have no, you should do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but righteous to all you judge, all you judge your neighbor. So in this case, your neighbor is fellow Israelite. You shall not go around as a slander among the people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. But you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. And so, this is where we get the passage. It says, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Here, neighbor is both Israelite, but also Israelite and member of humanity. They both are connected in God's eyes. You shall not treat them poorly. You should treat them well. And we see God highlight specifically the foreigner who is living among you in verse 34. You shall treat the stranger who subjoins with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. The same command to the foreigner around you, as your brother, as your neighbor. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And so God is giving commands on how we should treat each other. He's like, you should love your neighbor as yourself. And then all the Israelites are like, I know who my neighbor is. It's my fellow Israelites. And then God, a few verses later, goes, clarification. The foreigners around you, you need to love them as yourself. So there's no division between Israelite and foreigner. You love them both as yourself. God gives that command. Because it makes us ask the question, who is our neighbor? And I gotta tell you, I had, a, I had a pretty profound moment yesterday as I'm trying to wrestle with this scripture. I went down to Portland, um, we did a couple things and we went to Trader Joe's. And I'm in Trader Joe's and the Portland Pride Parade had just gotten out. Now, I don't have anything against the LGBT community. I follow God's command very seriously. Love your neighbor as yourself. But it was overwhelming with the amount of culture that I had around me. And so I'm standing there. I have this intrinsic need in my heart to say, I'm not going to celebrate sin, regardless of what that is. But I have to love my neighbor as myself. So I'm not going to be rude. And I'm not going to be polite. I'm not going to be... I will be polite. I'm not going to be rude. I'm not going to make them feel poorly. That wasn't a Freudian slip. I'm earnestly bad with words. And it was this unique blend where everyone, because the parade had just gotten out, the streets were full, it was packed, and it was really that moment of stranger in a strange land as I was standing there being practically maybe one of like three people not covered in rainbow in this store. I felt isolated regardless of what my views would have been just by attire alone made me feel isolated from those around me. And it was one of those anxious moments because I am burdened with understanding our Christian culture. And our Christian culture is to push back against the world and push back against that and say, no, no, I don't want to be a part of it. There's nothing that I could do in this moment. I was there. I was in the middle of it. And this kept ringing in my head. How can I love my neighbor as myself? So I would let people go down the aisle in front of me as I'm using my carts. And I didn't get upset or I didn't get impassioned. But I saw 99% of them look like normal people with a t-shirt or something. Some of them looked a little different, 
Looked a little like, cover your eyes, kids. But it wasn't the, it wasn't the vast majority of them. Um, but I had this strange dynamic that I was trying to reconcile with. And just like, where do I feel like? I felt like a fish out of water. And I just kept hearing these passages ringing through my head. Who is my neighbor? God commands us clearly that we are to love the strangers around us. For Israel, that was their neighbors who hated them. And the nation of Israel still practices that. They still give aid to Syria and Lebanon and Jordan and all of the people around them that profess to destroy them. They still go out of their way to try to help them in humanitarian crisis. They follow that practice very well. Because to love someone isn't just to say, oh, I love them, and then do nothing. To love someone means to care about them, to act, to help them, to serve them, to participate in their life in some way. Because, I mean, all of us could sit around and say, hey, I love these guys, but do nothing. Like, I love the dolphins, and I show it by buying every flipping stupid piece of merchandise you can possibly find <laughs> and paying for the profits of people that have disappointed me for so long and will continue to disappoint me regardless of the hope they give me. Um, I can tell you, I hope one day that long after uh, you guys hopefully are gone, when I finally take my last breath, I hope Amber can find a group of former Dolphins players to be my pallbearers so they can let me down one more time. That's my goal. Let me down one more time. But I want to I want to make this clear for you. I want to connect you to my moment that I had yesterday with how Boaz treated Ruth, who was a foreigner. He could have held her to that foreign standard, like neighbor, and he doesn't. He identifies specifically, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I already turned to my next scripture. He's, he says, like, you've entrusted God, so I pray that God will give you a full reward for that. Like, he's recognizing that she's become part of the family. Is she an ancestor of Israel? No, but she's definitely not a foreigner anymore. She's in this middle area in which we find most of our brothers and sisters around the world who worship together. But I can tell you that whenever we start talking about foreigners and other people, it gets very hairy for the human race. Racism is built on this understanding of they are different than me. Hatred is built through these lenses. Israel ran into that in the Old Testament. God commanded a lot of it, but they had this, these people are different than us. We see extra biblical stories, which I'll talk about in a second from the time of Jesus, in which you run into this animosity and hatred towards your neighbor. Um, we're commanded to love our neighbor and love the foreigner, not hate them. Because when we hate them because they're different, then it doesn't, it's not only does something wrong in our hearts, it's a violation of God's law. But we do it. We're afraid of things we don't understand. And fear turns to anger and animosity and hatred. We're celebrating Juneteenth today. Juneteenth is a day in which we're reminded of America's great sin of slavery. But America wasn't the only country. We didn't invent slavery. It existed long before us. We saw it in Egypt with Israel. We've seen it across the globe. There's still slavery in the world today, whether we want to think about it or not. Um, bigotry and hatred it didn't start with us. The world has perfected it from time to time to time. But it's something that's always been ingrained in it. And we're always at risk. We're always at risk for us when we sit back and we say, you know what? I don't like those people because they act differently than us. They make me uncomfortable. I'm not going to be around them. I'm not going to associate with them. We run into those risks all the time. Because we can start putting them in other categories. Like if I wasn't careful being stuck in the middle of a Trader Joe's, I could start being like, look at all these heathen sinners who hate God. I don't know if any of them are professed Christians or not. They didn't wear a cross around their neck. They didn't identify their faith. I saw a couple of them that I'm like, there's no way they're a Christian. Because they had a giant pentagram around their neck and 
I'm like, yeah, I can definitely know that you're probably not part of my brotherhood, but other than that, most of them you can really tell. But you know what? It's this idea of, do I want to make them my enemy? They're strangers. They have a different culture. They have a different understanding than I do. Does that make me want to recoil and dislike them and hate them? Or do I respond with love and with respect and with dignity to the humanity as we need to do? Because as I was going through my notes, I stumbled across a fantastic quote uh, that said, oh, that's my quote. It's right here. Uh, I want to give the right person credit. Her name is Anne Lamont. And Anne Lamont says, you can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when it turns out God hates all the same people you do. We do that a lot. We tend to make enemies. We tend to dislike people. We tend to withhold God's grace from people we don't deserve, think deserve it. And we, we tend to be like, ah, God hates all those people. Because I don't like them. So God must hate them. And it doesn't work that way. And I want to give you an example of which Jesus has flat out proven that to us. Just so you know, I'm not making stuff up. All right. Oh, where is it? Let's know. There we go. Luke 10, 25 through 29. All right. We're in the chapter of Luke. We're in Luke right now. It's chapter 10, 25 through 29. Jesus is having a conversation with a lawyer who stood up to test him and said, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit life? And Jesus repeats the Shema, which I spoke about earlier uh, in Matthew. He says it again here in Luke. He says, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the teacher here quotes, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and, your um, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. This is a common teaching from Jesus. Anyone following him loosely probably heard him say this time and time again. He was an itinerant preacher. He traveled around. He had really the same greatest hits that he told every community because they couldn't buy it on DVD. They had to hear it right from his mouth. And so this lawyer knew exactly what Jesus would say. Because he'd said it before, as we know from Matthew. And Jesus said, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? That's the question, right? They were still struggling with that. Who is my neighbor? Is it the foreigner I don't like and disagree with? Is it the person who lives right next door to me? Is it the same person that's on the... The school board with me? Who's my neighbor? And Jesus delivers one of the most powerful and probably the most scandalous parable in the entire Bible once you get the context behind it. Because Jesus doesn't even answer the person's question. He answers it with a story. He said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed him, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by to the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place where he saw him, he passed by to the other side. A priest in charge of the temple and managing the temple. A Levite serves the priest. It's essentially saying a pastor walked by and did nothing, and then a deacon walked by and did nothing. And now, if you're hearing this as a Jewish audience, you're thinking they're going to say, all right, and now a lay Israelite, meaning like a, a member, like a church member walks by. That's going to be the next step. But no, Jesus does something different. Jesus says, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw them, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring, oil, pouring out oil and wine, very expensive, and when he set him on his own animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him, the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor who, of the man who fell among the robbers? And the man, which I'll explain in a moment very begrudgingly had to say, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, go, do, you go and do likewise. This is a very scandalous passage of scripture that we've lost. And if you don't spend time reading your Bible, you won't see the highlight. Because you're going to think three different people 
Well, one of them walked up and helped the guy. Who was his neighbor? The one who helped. But this was a flat-out insult to Jewish leadership in Israel. Because Samaritans and Israelites were not friends. They were literally having a cold war among each other. Samaria is around the Jericho area. It was in northern Israel outside of Judea. I mean, these were people that we find in 2 Kings 17. This area has been repopulated by Assyrians that had forcibly expelled the original Israelites. So Israel, Jews, did not recognize Samaritans as Israelis. They looked at them as, like, multi-bred, maybe a little Israel tradition, but mostly pagan, Assyrian replacements. They were not friends. They did not look at each other as peers, as brothers, as anything. In fact, they were going through some pretty intense cold wars. Um, there was a moment in time in which Samaritans came down during a Passover, and they went through and they scattered animal bones on the ground around the temple as they kind of mixed in with the group, which forced Passover to be over because they, uh, they um, well, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Desecrated the temple. They couldn't complete Passover. In response to this, Jews literally went up into Samaria, into Mount Gershon, and burned their temple down. Like, destroyed it. Like, these were not friends. This is not like grumpy old men where the two neighbors end up being buddies at the end of it. No, this is like U.S. and Russia, Cold War. We hate each other, and we're going to attack each other by proxy. Relationships. These are not friends. So what Jesus literally said is, your priest went out and walked by this man and didn't help him. Your Levite went out and didn't help your enemy, the one you despise, the one you dislike, the one as you look at as inferior, did the right thing. That's what Jesus is instructing us here. It's a powerful, powerful passage. Who's your neighbor? Is it everyone who agrees with you? Are those the only ones that you love? Is it just your brother or your sister? Or is your neighbor the world around you? It's generally the world around you. Because we have to remember this as we're living in this world. It's easy for us to look at the story of Ruth and Boaz. And I promise you this is my closing. To look at the story of Ruth and Boaz as... Where Boaz, where the Israelite, right? Like all of these people that we interact with day to day are coming into our world, into our community. It's not that. It's the other way around. This is their world for all respects, whether we like it or not. Ultimately, it is God's world. God is in control. God has sovereign power over it, as we remind ourselves in Daniel. But at least for right now in our very lives, the world around us is going to be moving further from God, not closer to God. We all have revelation. We know how it ends. But we very often are foreigners. If you follow Christ, you are a member of his kingdom. He pointed out saying, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, everyone would take up their arms and they would fight back. If we are members of the kingdom of God, our kingdom, very real right now, is a heavenly kingdom, which will, when Jesus returns, become an earthly kingdom. And a new heaven, and a new earth. It ain't that right now. We're not Boaz. We're Ruth. We're the sojourners. We're living among people who dislike us, who hate us. It's easy to lose sight of that in America because so many people around us identify as Christian, we can almost get lost in our own little pods, in our own little groups. But our brothers and sisters who live in Iran, they know this very well. Our brothers and sisters who live in China, they're aware of this. This is the world, and we are the sojourners. So we must remind ourselves of that as we interact. 
We are called to love our neighbor as ourselves, which means helping those we would deem unworthy, whatever that may be. It means getting upset with yourself when you're uncomfortable going into a situation and question, why am I not comfortable here? This is God's king. This is God's world. He's in charge of it. But we have an opportunity to serve fellow humanity around us, to show Christ by how we live. Remember, Christ went to a cross and died for the world so that anyone who believes in him will live. And as he was on that cross, the very Romans who nailed him there, he prayed for them, seeking God's forgiveness over them. We, brothers and sisters, got to get a whole lot better for praying for the world around us. We want to be reminded that even though we're Ruth, we still have an opportunity to faithfully follow God. Pray for your neighbors. Help them and support them. Whether or not they're Christian. Especially if they're not Christian. And that way you will show them Christ. Let us pray. Lord, I ask that you be with us today. This world is filled with so much hate, so much animosity, so much racism, so much fear, Lord. I pray that we don't add to it. I pray that we are reminded that as members of the kingdom, that we get our strength from your love and your mercy and your grace, not the mobs of the world. I pray, Lord, that we recognize that you call us to be radically different that we are to love those who hate us and pray for those who persecute us, not hunt and hate those who are different than us. And Lord, I pray that every person that comes in contact with us turns to you, that they seek your face and that they bend their knee to Jesus as Lord and Savior. But Lord, I pray that we don't determine whether or not they've bent their knee to you before we choose to love them and help them. Look after us, Lord. Guide us. Guard us. Let us seek out sin and bring it into the light. But let us always remind ourselves that we're commanded to love over hate. Look after us, Lord. This is a hard teaching. One humanity has not been good at. Be with us, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. All right.